Happy Tuesday, everyone, and welcome to week eight of the Lambda Conf 2020's Global Edition. Here today with us, we have Jacob Yannick, and he is going to be speaking on the Scala Server Toolkit and how to write FP microservice step-by-step. -step. Thank you for joining us, Jacob, and we're looking forward to your presentation. All right, thank you. So let me start. So hello everyone, uh, my name is Jakub Janeček and I'm a lead software engineer here at Ava Software in Prague, Czech Republic. Uh, I'm glad I, could, I can present to you today a Scala Server Toolkit, which is a project I've been working on for the last half a year, probably. And this was supposed to be a workshop, to our workshop, where I was hoping that I would lead people through practical exercises where they could try it out. Unfortunately, due to the virus, we couldn't meet. So I will give you a short introduction to the toolkit. And then I will uh, write the code myself and show you how it can be used. So let's start. First of all, a bit of history. Uh, we have been using Scala at Avast since around 2011, which is a long, long time ago. And we went through the usual stages of Scala developers. That's how I like to describe it. So, of course, we started with Scala and we used it as, as better Java. Only the, we used only the bet, better and more flexible syntax. And that's a good start, of course, but then you get to the so-called idiomatic Scala uh, part where you use a lot of case classes, you use immutable data structures, uh, you use the full power of Scala collections and things like that. And that's also great. And then you read all these articles about functional programming and how it's great, how it's gonna change the world and everything. So you start wondering, and you also get into this train of FP, and that's where we are right now. So right now we are trying to write uh, backend microservices in Scala using functional programming here at Avast. Uh, all of this means that we have a lot of diverse code bases and we do not have a similar approach how we wrote them. So that's one of the issues. And also when we started with Scala, there weren't many frameworks or libraries we could use. We had quite special needs. So we wrote a lot of in-house solutions uh, in the past. And that's also a thing to think about. That's why I'm talking about it. So what, what are the issues we, we have? We like common style. I talked about it. Uh, as we were using different styles of Scala, uh, we have different and diverse code bases and we don't have a common style which we can use and which we can introduce and teach our newcomers. And it's very hard to get them up to speed. So you show them one backend and they see one style of, of Scala, let's say the idi idiomatic Scala, and then they, we show them a newer backend and they see a completely different code base and they're, they're, it's not very easy for them to to, to learn that. And we see that as, a, and as, as an issue. And of course, we have all these internal libraries and it's quite hard to maintain them. So in the beginning, it was quite fun to write them, but right now it's not so much fun to, to maintain them. So that's another issue. So what's the solution? Well, the solution uh, is of course to focus on open source. Nowadays, there's so many libraries we can choose from that it really doesn't make sense to, to make our own. So we've decided to focus more on open source and use as much code as we can uh, and don't write it, of course. Uh, also, we wanted to somehow unify the way we write our backend microservices. And since we are somehow converging uh, into the FP Scala world, uh, we want to have a single way how we write uh, our code and how we initialize components. And of course, there's so many libraries, but somehow you need to integrate them. And some, sometimes there are missing pieces and you have to write them again and again. So we need to provide these. And the solution is Scala Server Toolkit. So the idea of uh, Scala Server Toolkit was born and we've decided to write it. It's, it's not something uh, genius. It's, it's basically just what I've described. It's an open source, uh, library that gives you the unified way how to 
uh, initialize components or libraries and that integrates them together so that it's quite easy to, to start with a new backend project. Uh, side note about Zio. Uh, if Z layer or Zio itself uh, would have been available before, we would probably not come up with SST. When we were starting with SST, Z layer was not, does, didn't exist and Zio was really not production ready, I would say. So, and we, we had the need to, to come up with something because we needed to write our new services. So we created SST. Nowadays, our decision would probably be different. On the other hand, uh, SST is using constructor-based injection, which is much more approachable to newcomers, I would say. So it has its benefits. And it's also useful to people that don't wanna go full Zio. So even us, we are using Zio, but uh, not in all our services. We are also using Monix task. So for those people uh, using SST can be quite good too. So something about the design of uh, SST. So it's designed or it's split based on dependencies. So it contains multiple sub projects and each sub project is dependent only on small set of uh, other libraries. So the idea behind that is that if you ever decide to get rid of some dependency, you want to replace it by some, some else. For example, let's say you want to get rid of HTTP 4S and replace it by Zio HTTP. You can quite freely do so because not much code should depend on this. Of course, it promotes functional programming. That's one of the cornerstones. It promotes type safe configuration. We used to use uh, Lightband config directly but nowadays we always configure our programs using case classes and we load the configuration into the case classes using some library in our case pure config and of course we promote proper resource management uh, in the past we had trouble with resource management because our, our backends as they were long living we didn't really have to worry about resource management but once we started to use them in tests and run them uh, repeatedly, we've often encountered a lot of resource leaks. And since we started using Cats Effect resource data type, with data type, all of these problems went away. So that's what we are using in SST2. And there is no dependence injection. We are, we are using plain constructors. Uh, even though, of course, dependence injection has its uh, benefits for large applications, for most small backend microservices, which is what we're doing. You don't need anything. You just can, you can just use constructors and it's, it's okay. Uh, here's a list of uh, sub projects that are available in SST right now. So there's support for HTTP 4S server and client on top of the Blaze implementation. There is some support for JVM uh, utilities like console, random and thread pools. We do support Doobie for Relation database access, Cassandra database, Flyway for, for database migrations, Micrometer for monitoring of the applications, Pure Config for the type safe configuration, and we do have so called bundles, which, which are bundles of multiple dependencies together for Zio and Monix, because that's the default basically. <clears throat> and now, uh, I would like to explain a concept of module. Uh, again, it's nothing special. It's just a naming convention. Uh, module is a piece of code that initializes some component or library. Usually it's an object or a class. It has a method called make usually. It, it takes some configuration and other dependencies and it gives you the component initialized. So that's what you can see in the return type. Uh, and when you have multiple modules, you combine them in a for comprehension like this. So let, let's say you have component or components A, B, and C, and let's say B depends on A. So first you have to make A and give it to B so that it can be initialized, and then you can give A and B to C, and then you can run your program. So again, nothing special, just Scala code. And that was the short presentation. And now we can get to demo. 
I'm gonna show you how to write a simple HTTP microservice that reads some data from uh, Postgres database. You'll see the type safe configuration, you'll see the resource management. Uh, it will also include some monitoring. So let's get to the code. Um, I hope everyone can see and read the code. So here I have a repository with some code prepared already, but I will write most of it myself so that you can see how it, how it feels. So the first thing you need usually in your application, of course, is to read your configuration. So that's the type safe configuration I was talking about. So for that, uh, you have a, a module called, called pure config module and it's able to read the case class out of configuration file, which you can see here. So here I have a reference conf file. It's already filled with my configuration, but you will see how it's loaded into the case classes later. And we are using, or we're supporting pure config library to load this uh, into the configuration case class. Oh, sorry. So it, yes. So I, right now I need to create the case class that represents the configuration. So first of all, this is my top level case class, which represents the whole, the root of the configuration. So the first thing we will want to start up is the HTTP server. So we'll create a HTTP 4S Uh, Blaze server config. So this is a case class that's provided by uh, SST and it represents the whole configuration of HTTP 4S server. So all the configuration options that are available there are represented here in the case class and we can reuse it in our code. Of course, we will need some uh, config reader uh, from pure config. And I need some imports here. So this is a semi-auto derivation of config reader for this case class. And for it to work, I also need to import the config readers from SST. So this way, if I import these implicits here, I will be able to read this configuration case class and derive a, con a config reader for my case class configuration. So let's go back to the main class. I need to import it here. And what's the problem? Make a race. Mm. Yeah, I'm think, oh no, here, I made a mistake. I'm not sure what the problem is, but we'll find out quite soon, I guess. <laughs> uh, it's very strange. All right, so, Okay, I'm missing the, okay, this should be. Try to compile it. For some reason, it was not able to use the method that loads this automatically. I will look at it later. That's not. So right now we have a configuration loaded into this case class and we can start our HTTP 4S server. For that, we have a module called HTTP 4S place server 
module. And again, it is a method called make. And we can give it the configuration of our server. It needs some HTTP app, which is the routing. I'll get to that a little bit later. And it needs some execution context. And we can give it execution context from the runtime, zero runtime. And I also need some import here, zero interrupt. Okay. Uh, by the way, you might wonder where this runtime comes from. Uh, so this whole main object extends from zero server app, which is a trade from SST. And it gives you basically, it's able to run a server app, HTTP for a server app for you uh, using zero. So you get the runtime here. And now we need the routing. So we'll create a HTTP module. And it will contain the routes. HTTP routes is a class from HTTP 4S. It gives you a DSL to define routing. So let's say I will define the get route, so the typical hello. I will return hello world. And again, we're missing some imports here. It's interrupt with gets effect or gets libraries of zero. And now I can make the HTTP app out of that. There is a class called HTTP for us routing. And it's able to wrap the routes and make an end out of it. So now we can replace these triple question marks with HTTP module router. Now we should be able to run our server, which I will try to do right now. No, we're not because I didn't return it. So let me try again. Yes, and as you can see, a demo server was started on port 8080. And if, oh, sorry, I will close this. And if I try to call it, so I will call localhost 8080. Hello. Oh, I'm LBT, that will not work. So again, HTTP localhost 880. Oh, not found. I didn't write hello here. Okay, so you can see it returned hello world. So this is the first, first success. <laughs> now we can continue. I will show you how to add some monitoring to your application. So, for that, SST supports a library called Micrometer. It's, uh, it's basically something like what SLF4J is doing for logging. So Micrometer is a monitoring facade for many other uh, libraries or technologies which you can use. Uh, so you need to create a so-called meter registry and you can use, let's say, Micrometer JMX module for that. Again, it is a method called make and it requires a configuration from you. So this is when we need to go back to our case class and we need to add another section here with micrometer JMX config. And again, I need to add an import to import the standard config readers. So micrometer JMX your config implicit. And this should give us uh, the config readers and I have the meet registry now. It's based on JMX. And I can use it to, let's say, get some uh, metrics from our JVM. Uh, so there's a module called micrometer JVM module. 
I can give it the meet registry I just created. And since it's returning just task of unit, I need to wrap it in resource too, because it doesn't create any resources. And as you can see here, it's creating, this is basically the integration piece I was talking about. This is using the standard, standard features of micrometer, uh, which is the meter registry and these metrics classes here. And it provides the, the same interface to the user. So you have the module with the make method and it all fits in. So, and these classes provide some basic metrics for your JVM. For example, it monitors uh, garbage collector, CPU load and things like that. And by just using it like this, you get the metrics. So if I now run my application again, should load. Um, and I go to Visual VM. Uh, and I will find my demo application here. Just make this a bit smaller. And I go to MBINs. You can see I have the com avast lambda conf section here. And you can see there's some metrics like CPU count. So I have a 12 processors. You can see a load here. So the load is 5.5. So this is how you can monitor your application. And this is not everything. This is just the JVM metrics. And I will show you later how to monitor or how to make metrics for your own, uh, for your own application. So, so this is monitoring. And now let's go to database. So let's create the module for Postgres. So again, it will have a make method and we'll need some Postgres config, which doesn't exist yet, but we'll create it a bit later. We'll need some executor module which is uh, a thing provided by SSD again. Uh, and we'll need meet the registry to monitor our database access layer. And what it will return, it will return a resource of task of Hikari transactor. Format this. So Hikari Transactor is a class from uh, Doobie. It's, it's a transactor using Hikari uh, database connection pool. But first we need this Postgres config. So let's go to configuration case class and let's make a Postgres section here with Postgres config and you need to create a Postgres config case class. And it will contain several, several things. Uh, so it will contain a section for Duby. So it will have a Duby Hikari config. Again, this is a class case class provided by SST, which contains all the configuration op options for Duby Hikari. Uh, it will contain a section for uh, it will contain a section for configuration of uh, fret pool. Uh, Duby requires you to give it a bounded executor for connection pool, so you need to provide that. Again, I can use a class from SST fret pool executor config and. We will also want a flyway DB migration, which I can add to. Uh, of course, I need to derive a pure config reader for this. And I need some imports here. And I need to import the config readers for the case, case classes from SSD. So first is Duby. And the other one is Flyway, and the other one is JVM. So all of these are provided by SST, and 
it also provides the config readers for rows. So this is the configuration. Uh, you can see it here. We configure a Postgres driver with some uh, connection strength. We configure the bounded connection executor and we configure Flyway here. Flyway doesn't really need to be configured. Uh, it's just empty section. So now we have the Postgres config ready. And we can go back to the Postgres module and initialize our, uh, our database here. So what we will do is first we'll need the bounded connect executor. We'll take the executor module provided in a parameter and we can make a thread pool executor here. Uh, configuration is in our configuration case class and it also requires you to give it a thread, uh, thread factory. There's configurable thread factory in SST. Some config. So I give give the threads from the Hikari pool some name. Uh, it's not really important in this case. So I have the bounded connect executor now, uh, and I can make a Doobie transactor. So there's Doobie Hikari module make. Here. Oh no, it's not right. So, yeah. so I have the Postgres config to be. I give it the executor I just created. I can give it a blocker from the executor module, which is already created. And it also, I can also give it optionally some uh, monitoring metric tra metrics tracker factory. So I will do that. Uh, but I also need to create it. So I got a matrix here. Uh, new micrometer. I can give it the meter registry. Yes. And I can yield to do be transactor here. I think I'm again missing the zero interrupt imports. And what's the problem here? Oh, execute. So uh, I need to map this. to execution context, so. I think, so now it compiles. So this will give me a Doobie transactor with metrics and properly configured, uh, properly configured transactor with thread pool. And I can create, use it here now, Postgres module. Make Postgres. and it wants executor module and it wants meter registry. So I do have meter registry, but I don't have the executor module created yet. So I can create it here. Executor module again, it's provided by SST, and I can create it from execution context, for example. I can take one from the runtime, so executor as execution context. So this will give me the Hikari transactor and uh, let me, yes, yes. And now we could run it but it won't do anything special. So let's add the DB migration part. So, uh, no, can go back here. So now we will create a flyway 
instance flyway module make it requires a data source and we can get the data source from the Hikari tunnel sector it's it has this strange name kernel i don't really know why and it requires a config and we already have that in our configuration so progress flyway and it's not a resource so i need to again lift it to resource so this will give me a flyway instance and i can i can run it by calling migrate on it and i need to of course i need to wrap it in task and into resource lift it into resource and what will this method what it will do is it will look for migration scripts and I have some ready here. Uh, so if in your resources you have a directory called db slash migration and you have uh, a script there like this, it will use that uh, it will use that script to initialize your database. So this is what will happen here. And I think we could try to run and you should know that I have uh, I have Docker Compose with Postgres database ready in the background, so Postgres is already running on my system. So now I can run the demo again, and we should see that the database is initialized. So as you can see, it was initializing Hikari transactor here, and you can see that it's connected and it's validating some migrations and it's running them and the database is ready for me so this is really great and now we can write some business logic finally hmm. so what we need now is let's say we'll write some demo demo service Right. So please do not take this as the best application design. This is a demo only. So I will make some uh, shortcuts in the design, of course. But I hope you'll understand. So let's say we'll make a demo service which is able to read a user out of a database. Of course, you need to give it a user ID and it will return an option of the user. So we're missing these model classes now so let's make them so first we'll need user id so it's final case class it will be a begin so this is it this is a user id and we'll create a user has a ID which is user ID. It has first name, last name. So this basically copies the, the structure of the database with the same, the same fields. And what we need, similar to pure config, but right now we we will be using Cersei to encode our data model into JSON when we return it to the user from our HTTP endpoint. So we need some uh, encoders, Cersei encoders. So, and I can, okay. So we need to create an entity encoder task and user which is JSON encoder of user and we need okay maybe in our tests we will need also a decoder which is JSON of okay and we are missing uh, I will use the generic auto derivation for the for the other 
part so that I don't have to write it myself here. And I'm missing an import. So again, zero interrupt gets is one of the most important imports here. <laughs> uh, so now I, have, now I have data model and I can import it into my demo service. Let's say I will implement it here. Let's call it, call it a Postgres demo service. It will want a Doobie transactor. And of course it will extend from the demo service. So let's implement the method. And also we might want some metrics. So let's give it the meter registry from micrometer. Maybe we need to import that. We can implement it now. So first thing, let's say we want to count the number of times this method was called. So let's use the meter registry, make a counter called requests and let's increment it immediately. Of course, this is a simplified way how to do this in, in, in real. I wouldn't do it this way, but let's use it for now. And we need to read something from the database. So let's, uh, let's write an SQL query. Select everything from, sorry, users where ID equals uh, user ID, you know, user value, okay. And I think we're missing import of doobie implicit. And we will query a user out of this query. It will be an option and we can run it immediately using doobie. And we can return the result. Again, we are missing some inputs in here. That's, and that's it. So we should be able to compile this now. We check it. Yes. And we can go back to the HTTP module. We can create a another endpoint here. So let's say it will be root users. And let's say it will be a long bar user ID. And we need to do something here. What we need to do is we need to get the demo service as a dependency. Uh, and then we can call it. So we'll call the demo service user and we can flat map the, the result to to make an okay response out of it. And otherwise if there's no user found we can return not found. So this should hopefully that's the problem. So this this returns a task of optional user. So let me get back to this a bit later. We can go to demo now. We need to create our HTTP module. We need to give it the demo service. So let's create the demo service. Press demo service. 
you need to give it the transactor and you need to registry. And now we can do this. So, so this is it. And I need to fix the problem we had in the HTTP module. So this returns. Here I'm mapping the, okay. Oh, okay, I made a mistake. So here I'm calling the demo service. I'm reading a user using the uh, variable provided in the bar. Uh, and then I make it an HTTP okay response out of it. Otherwise I'm returning not found if the user was not found. And if I run the demo now, it should start up properly. Yes, the database is already initialized, so it will not initialize again. And now if I'm going to try it, so I can call the users. Let's say I will put the three there. It will return me not found. If I use ID one, which is the, the only uh, row I have there, it should return the user. So this is what can be seen in the in its script. I was inserting myself there. And this is the end of my presentation. So Courtney, you can start asking questions. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jacob, for shortening your two hour presentation to this um, really quick look at the Scala server toolkit. We appreciate it. Um, so the first question that we have is, um, is there does there exist a way to externalize the credentials such that they do not exist in the text of the configuration? Sure. Uh, so I don't know if you know type safe config, which is the, or this is a Hocon format of the, uh, of the configuration file. And this is usually read by a library called type safe or liban config. And this library supports uh, external properties which can be used here. So for example, or environment variables. So for example, I could write password here and then uh, Postgres password. So this syntax with the question mark, if the Postgres password environment variable exists, it will replace this conf hard coded value. If it doesn't exist, it will use this conf value. So of course, usually, all the passwords are externalized because you don't want to have them committed in your Git repository. Okay, thank you. Um, were there any software architecture principles which were a motivation or goal for you in developing this project? Wow, <laughs> that's a question. Uh, yeah. Basically, Scala Server Toolkit, we decided to create Scala Server Toolkit because we needed a unified way how to write our services and how to initialize them. And there were nothing out in the world that would satisfy our needs. Nowadays, as I said, we would probably go with Zio or something like that. But half a year ago, Zio wasn't that ready, unfortunately. Anyway, I still think it has some like benefits because it's a bit, a bit easier for newcomers, I think. Scala Server Toolkit is a bit new, easier for newcomers to, to learn. And uh, I, I think in the documentation, I write something like it's a combination of best practices from Avast. So that's the software engineering principles we were using. Like it's 10 years of Scala, Scala, Scala development, uh, like put together in Scala Server Toolkit, I would say. Okay. Um, were there difficult decisions that you made when developing this project? Uh, not really. Like, uh, I think the, the main decisions we have to make is which 
dependencies we want to support or how to how to structure the project regarding the dependencies so as i said i want i want to make it flexible so that you can always quite easily replace certain part with some other part uh, on the other hand you also need some integration pieces so there's this problem of making a lot of sub projects that combine the dependencies in different ways but i i decided to do that actually i can show you i think if i'm able to switch uh, so if i go to scala server toolkit on github github you can see it contains a lot of modules and that's because we're doing different combinations of dependencies so that you can always choose only the things you need and want and you can replace them quite easily if you need to uh, yeah i guess that any more questions you know we don't have any other questions at the moment if anybody has any other questions please go ahead and give them to us now um we did have somebody ask it, whether your code would be available on GitHub afterwards. Yes, I, yes, actually it's already, well, not the final, uh, not the final version, but I do have, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so in my GitHub profile, uh, which is my name, Jakub Janeček, slash lambda 2020 uh, demo, there's this uh, template I used at the beginning and I will commit the code uh, after the presentation or maybe tomorrow because I'm getting a bit tired now. Sure. Uh, and yes, okay. the slides um, are also available so we will somehow post them. I will wonderful. send them and you can share them. Yeah. I'm, if you are willing to let me do so, I am happy to post the, um, the link with your talk on YouTube. Yes. So just send me whatever you want everybody to be able to access and I will post them with your video. Um, okay, so one more question did come through. So do you have any rec recommendations about any patterns that you developed which might be useful outside of the context of Scala? Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure, I guess, no. I, I, it's not nice to say, but I, I used to say that like Scala Server Toolkit is nothing special. It's it's really, you know, it's nothing compared to Zio itself or some other libraries provided with the open source. We really only took other libraries and gave them a simple facade so that they look similar uh, from the outside. But other than that, it's it's nothing more special. So. Nothing, I guess, yeah. Okay. Certainly somebody else I'm sure could take it and use it for something other than Scala if they found it applicable to their use. Yeah, well, the, the end goal was to be uh, approachable to newcomers. So basically, I think that any new Scala developer or someone trying to get into functional programming in Scala should be, or Scala Server Toolkit should be quite approachable to, to them. So I hope, at least I hope so. so. All right. Well, hey, we're glad that there's this resource out there. Thank you very much, Jacob, for giving this talk today and for showing us this resource, um, for helping work on this resource. We appreciate it. Um, and um, we hope that it's helpful to a lot of, as you said, um, newer Scala people and we um, will certainly point them to it as much as we are able. Thank and you. I'm glad I could give you the talk and of course if anyone wants to contact me you can contact me on Twitter or using GitHub or maybe email. Uh, I'm available to any, any questions later. All right, thank you again.